All right, here's a problem. It's just for fun. So we have three sequences. In every sequence, we have three values. And what we would like to have is one resulting sequence that combines every value in the original sequences column-wise. How can we do that? So there are, of course, many ways we can start using ListZip or we can use a data library like Deedle. It's very well suited for these kind of tasks. But I would like to show you an alternative to have a solution that looks very close to the words that I just said. And how is that supposed to mean? So what I said was I would like to have a resulting sequence where each value of the original sequence X, Y and Z is combined in a column wise way. But the problem is, it is not working because it is not column wise. It is more like a Cartesian product where we use, uh, where we combine every value in one sequence with all the other values in all other sequences. <laughs> so we do not have three values. We have 27 values. Okay. But what can we do? Let's go step by step. So when we start to evaluate that whole computation what do we need so we have that sequence here and then we would like to to pull one value out of that sequence and continue with the rest of our whole computation and when we visit a sequence again in a four comprehension then we would like to do the same we would like to pull one value out and continue with the rest of the computation and once we can do that as many as, uh, as as often as we would like. Uh, and in the end, we can do something with the values that we have pulled out of all the sequences. So in the next evaluation cycle, what happens then? We have, again, we understand, oh, this is sequence, but we have to understand that we already enumerated that sequence and that the first value is already pulled out. So we need state. So, so this must be uh, somehow um, uh, state based, let me say. So we have to, to remember something from an evaluation cycle to another in the context of the whole computation. And this is the key point because usually we already remember something. So when we um, when we evaluate a sequence, we already remember the state and that state is called the enumerator. But what usually happens is that enumerator is then uh, we pull out a value and a next value and the next value and then we have nested computations. And this is the problem. We do not, we do not preserve the enumerators in the context of the whole computation. This is a big difference. So what we need is a mechanism that allows for preserving the enumerator of that sequence, or if it would be an array, we could say the index of that array, or if it's the list, then we would say we have to preserve the, the tail of the list, but somehow we have to preserve something after the whole computation is evaluated. And when we revisit the whole computation, we have to understand that for this, we already have some state and we can use it to evaluate that local entity, that local element for its own and continue with the rest of the computation. So this locality this is a key point here. Uh, let me say, if you are interested in the very details of that principle, and it's a principle that is not only working with sequences or lists, but is working basically with, with everything that has locality and needs to preserve its state in a bigger context from, um, evaluation cycle to the next from one call to subsequent calls. Yeah? 
This is the principle. And if you want to go in detail, uh, the friends of Amplifying F Sharp uh, and I, we have recorded a session that I will link in the description that you can uh, have a look on and to understand how exactly this is working. But here I will just give you a, um, a rough uh, view, a rough understanding of, of how it could happen. Let's have a look at the elements that we need. So the sequence is an object. Yeah is uh, an enumerator but we could also say it is a function it is a pure function this would also work uh, and it's a pure function that uh, what would it require so it requ it would require uh, its previous state as an input and it would have to output a value one value which is then basically this and also um, the state that should be preserved for the next evaluation cycle and also, we would require a mechanism that this thing can somehow say, hey, I have nothing more to give. I'm done. And that function would look like this. We have a state as input is optional and we output a value and a state which is also optional. And it means if none is outputted actually, then the whole thing stops. Then we would require something that composes these elements, these smaller local elements into a bigger element that of course then can be composed again with other elements to bigger elements and so on. Yeah, you know that composability thing. This is a big thing. This is a very important thing. And um, we have one function here. This is called the bind function, but we will not have a look at it today. I will just show you the code just for being a little bit more complete, but I will show you an example of how such a um, state aware function, let me, let me call it like this, how such a state aware function could look like. And just as a side note, um, this is not the state monad. This is something different. The state monad is more a, uh, it has more a global state value that might um, change during the evaluation of um, a um, computation. But we always have one value that we can um, set or get at the position where we are. Here we have more like uh, local elements and they have to retain their state from one evaluation to the next for the whole computation. This is, this is a difference. So as an example of how such a, um, such a state aware function could look like, um, yeah, is, is, is that what we have? Uh, already talked about. We have the sequence. We need a function that takes an enumerator, an optional enumerator. This is the state of the previous evaluation. And it is optional because it might be that uh, on the first evaluation we have nothing. Yeah? So we have to, to generate the enumerator. Yeah? And this is exactly what we do. So we say, oh, in the first evaluation cycle of the whole computation, we do not have an enumerator. We have to get it. And then we say enumerator move next. So we pull out one value of the enumerator. And if we have an enumerator, we take that and we spit out the current element as the actual usable value. And as state, we take the enumerator. That is then rubbed into an optional fed again into our state aware function in the next evaluation cycle. That's it. This is very simple. Yeah. Uh, and as I said before, uh, this is not limited to I enumerate or to sequences or to lists or to enumerators or whatever. I could easily implement a counter, let me say, um, which could look like that. I have a starting value and I have an increment and then I say, okay, it should be a, a white function and I say, okay, we have whatever kind of optional state, uh, that state for a counter, when we want to count values, we have to say, oh, in the first evaluation cycle, we do not have a state. We just output the starting value. And if we already have a state, the state in that case would just be the last value that we outputted because we have to refer to that and then increment it. And then we have to output an optional pair of the output value and the state. In our case, output value and the state for a counter, this is just the same. You know? We have just implemented a generator that is infinite. Uh, only restricted to technical limits, of course, not to thinkable limits. You just understand how easy it is to write these state aware functions. And now I will, I will show you how, how we can actually 
use our our sequence with a little bit of more magic we basically tweak f sharp in the context of such a state aware function so that we can use the for yield keyword and yield keywords to redefine them in the context of our computation and how does it look like now yeah it looks like that and if you compare it to the to the sequence that we said we aim for that way of writing it let me show you that was what we wanted to have from a writing point of view and this is what we have here this this looks similar just we we just said we do not want to have that um cartesian product semantic we would like to have a column semantic and this is what we say uh with this and you see white dot stream it just refers to that builder that uses this bind and return to show you uh, that is actually working to give you some evidence that's very easy we, i can just evaluate um the code that um that you see here and now i can evaluate that stream and you see this is exactly what we wanted we have a resulting sequence that combines every value in the original sequences column wise so that we have resulting values of 1 10 100 2 20 200 and 3 30 300. i hope you enjoyed it i wish you a happy new year and see you in 2024